Well, good morning, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name is Bonnie. I have the privilege of being part of the team here. And this morning, I have the privilege of bringing the word. And I just uh, know that God is up to something good this morning. Okay, well, that was convincing. God is up to something good this morning. He is always up to something good. He is good. He is love. He is God and he doesn't change. We might change, but he changes not. So Pastor Brett and Justine said love to all the family. Just uh, thinking of you this morning as they're in Perth celebrating a wedding in the family. And uh, we know that next week Pastor Brett will be back and we can expect a powerful word as we continue to study on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we've been looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit over the last few weeks and I'm going to continue a part of that today by looking at the gift of wonder-working faith. That's what the Amplified Bible says. It's the gift of wonder-working faith. What a beautiful gift. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are just so precious, given to us. 1 Corinthians 12, and I've got a slab of scripture here, but I think it's all important. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the common good of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptised into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the feet cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be the weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, on these we bestow greater honour. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honour to the part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Isn't the word of God amazing? If you didn't catch what Paul was saying through the Holy Spirit there, he was saying that we are all one body, and we are all an important part of that body, and we all have a role to play in the body, and we are all honoured in the body, and we are a part of something that God wants to do on this earth, in this area, this community that we are called to, and around the world, when each member of the body plays their part, there is glory to God. And the gifts are given to all. All are given the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
We're not given all the gifts, but we are all given gifts. And it is for the common good. Or it says it is for the profit of all. So from this verse, we can see that there are many gifts given to all by the Holy Spirit for the common good of all. I know I've said that twice, but I think you've got to think about it. The Holy Spirit has given gifts to all for the use of all, for the common good of all. So if you are not using the gift that you have been given, then you are not working towards the common good of all. And def by definition, a gift is freely given. We can do nothing to earn it or strive for it or achieve it or attain it. And when a gift is given, what do you do with that gift? Most often, what you should do with that gift is thank the one who gave it to you. Let us have gratefulness in our hearts for the gifts that we've been given. And then you should open it. No matter how pretty the package and the wrapping is, you should open a gift that you're given. Not a lot of points saying, that's very nice, thank you, I'll put it in my cupboard because I like the look of it. It's the inside contents that was the intention of the gift giver. And you should use the gift for the purpose that it was given. And there is a purpose for the gift that you have been given. So today we're going to be exploring a little more in depth the gift of wonder-working faith. The gift of faith may be defined as a special gift that's given by the Holy Spirit to the believer, which produces an extraordinary confidence in God's promises, his power and his presence, and enables them to take a heroic stand to see the fulfillment of what God has said. Does it that sound like a gift we need in the body? Men and women of Christ who are filled with the Holy Spirit and full of faith and who take heroic stands for God in their families and in our community and in our church. We need that, right? Okay, we're warming up. Let me say, we need that. Now, this faith that God's talking about here with the gift of the Holy Spirit is different to saving grace or saving faith, which all believers have been given. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So God's already given us a gift of faith. We have a gift of faith, every believer. If you haven't received a gift of faith, then you have not believed that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, rose again, and is seated on the right-hand side of the Father and is Lord of all, and you haven't surrendered your life to him. An opportunity will come for that. So it's a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one could boast. Can I just remind you, no one was smart enough to get saved in this place. No one was strong enough. No one was sure enough. No one was born in enough of the right family or had enough money. There was no way you could have saved yourself. That's why Jesus died on the cross. Once for all. For the Bible says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. We were all sinners. Sorry to break that to you if you're not aware of it. You were a sinner. But if you have confessed with your tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord and believed it in your heart, then the Bible says you are saved. And it's amazing because you didn't do anything. You couldn't have. But you are saved through the finished work of the cross. You can't get more saved than you were at that moment. So you have saving faith. The Bible also says that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Isn't that good? He's given us a measure of faith. He's given us a substance. The Bible calls faith a substance. He's given us something that helps us to believe that he is who he says he is and that he is able to do what he says he is able to do. That's what faith does. Faith encourages us to put our trust in God, to lean not on our own understanding, but to lean wholeheartedly on the one who is God Almighty. And then in Hebrews eleven six 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So this faith that we've been given, this gift that God's given us, we need to bring it when we come to God. If we can do it in our own strength or our own smarts or in our own money, then we are not coming in faith. So if you don't have an area in your life where you're coming to God in faith, you better dig a bit deeper because there must be something that is 
needed by you that only God can do. Because he is God. And maybe if you don't know what that area is, you just haven't thought about it hard enough. Because can I tell you, I've only got about 27 things in my life at the moment that need God. And I don't have to even think about it. I could name them all right now. And some of them are pretty big things. And some of them I've been waiting a long time for. But by faith, we come to God. So as believers, we must believe that God is who he says he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And Romans 14, 23 says that without faith, it is sin. So we all have been given faith or God would be setting us up to sin because if we were without faith, we would be sinning. And God is love and love doesn't set us up to fail because 1 Corinthians 13 says love never fails. So we know God has given us this gift. That's not the question. I guess the question might be if we all have faith, we all have that measure of faith given to us by God, what are we to do with it? So we have faith as a believer, but there is also a supernatural gift of faith, which is an ability to see a situation or circumstance that is beyond our control or power to change and to seek God first for the promise, to take a stand on his word, believing that he is who he says he is and walk that out by faith. The gift of faith enables some people to have an extraordinary amount of faith that God uses to show his powers in ways that create joy and encouragement for others. When you see the gift of faith in operation, your faith rises. When unbelievers see the gift of faith in operation, they suddenly think, wow, there might be something about that. Maybe it could just be that it's true. So the gift of faith is powerful and it's given by God for his glory. It's given to show us who he is, to remind us that he is all-powerful and all-knowing, that he is the healer, he is the way-maker, he is the miracle-working God that we sing about, but the gift of faith just activates that. And faith, it says in Romans, I think 10, 17, but you look it up when you get home, comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And sometimes you need to hear it. And sometimes you need to hear it come out of your mouth. And this is something I say to people all the time. If you've got a situation in your life, you better get God's word in your mouth and speak it out over that situation. Because every time you do that, faith comes. And your faith rises for that situation because the word of God does not return to him void, but it accomplishes that for which he sent it. And you need to be sure that you're sure that you're sure that your God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ask, hope, or imagine. I've got to keep going. <laughs> It's going to get out of control. So the gift of faith. Faith equips people with this special supernatural gift with the ability to take outlandishly heroic stands for God and his people. Don't you want to take an outlandishly heroic stand for God and for his people? Don't you want to be one who inspires faith in others? Don't you want to be one who comes around your friends and builds them up in their most holy faith? I'm going to skip ahead here, but I'll just there's a story in the New Testament. And it happens in the town of Capernaum. And God, uh, Jesus is there and he's in a house and he's ministering the word. Now this is like a connect group on overdrive. The house is full. They're at the windows. They're at the doors. They're in every seat. They're in the kitchen. They're in the toilet. They're everywhere listening because Jesus is speaking. And you can't get in no matter what you try. So four friends full of faith have brought their friend with them who's paralyzed. And they can't get him to Jesus. But they know if they just get him to Jesus, he will be made well. So all of a sudden, can you imagine being the owner of that home and you look up and there's like a saw coming through the roof and they're cutting a hole in your roof? They literally cut a hole in the roof and lowered their friend down in front of Jesus. Don't you want to have friends with that kind of faith? Don't you want to have friends that if you're going through something, that they have so much faith that they're willing to cut a hole in the roof to get you to Jesus? Come on. We can be those kind of people. Outlandishly heroic stands for God and his people. Hebrews 11 describes some of these people with gifts of faith and action that was brought about by their faith. It starts by telling us now faith is confidence. Do you feel confident today in your God? 
It's the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. And this is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So it takes it right back to the beginning. By faith, we believe God made this earth that we're in. By faith, we believe he made the stars that hang in the sky and the mountains that stand in their majesty and the rivers that ford through them and the wings on the hummingbird and the laugh in a baby's mouth. By faith, we believe God is creator of all things. And that is the key to faith. Knowing who you believe in and standing with feet firmly planted, confident in that belief. By faith, Noah built a boat, warned about things not yet seen in a time that had never known rain. When he didn't know what rain was, he didn't know what a boat was. He still built a boat by faith and it was an example to his family and ultimately saved humanity from dying out in the flood. So just take a moment to thank Noah for his faith because we are here because of his faith. By faith, Joshua's obedience in marching around Jericho showed his men what bold faith looked like. He believed God in the face of their enemies and in turn, he put God's faithfulness, power and protection on display for his people and his enemies. We ought to be putting God's power and his presence and his protection on display for our families and our friends and people in this community who do not yet know him. That's what faith does. By faith, Moses charged bravely into so many situations that should have led to death. And every time he dared to step forward on nothing but God's promises of protection, miracles took place. Not only did he eventually lead the entire population of Israel to freedom, he showed the power of God to thousands of Egyptians as well. Faith gets noticed. By faith, Daniel had no fear in the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego faced the fiery furnace, David fronted a giant, Gideon led an army, Peter walked on water and Jesus calmed a storm by faith. The list of names shows us fascinating stories of odds that were defied through someone else's miraculous faith. And here we are thousands of years later, still encouraged by these stories and the men and women who acted on the gift of faith that was given to them. Last week, Pastor Joel shared with us about Zacchaeus, Now, we might not think that Zacchaeus had a lot of faith, but he climbed a tree to see Jesus. He didn't really want to be out and about. He didn't really want anyone else to see him. But he just knew if he could just see this Messiah that everyone was talking about. He knew the scriptures. He knew the word. And he just wanted to see for himself. So by faith, a short little man climbed a really big tree. He took himself out on a limb. That was a joke. Okay. (laughs) All right. Faith Faith comes as a result of knowing who the God we serve is and what he can do in impossible situations in us and through us and for us. We must personally know the God of the Bible and be able to hear his voice. The gift of faith is a special ability to trust God, believing the Lord will keep his promises. As believers, there may be times in our lives where we will be given and will need to activate the gift of faith. There will always be through the Holy Spirit and for the glory of God. But until that day, we too can live by faith. You see, you don't have to just have the gift of faith to walk in faith, to live by faith. And I think, and I believe this is scriptural, that if you are faithful in the little things, much more will be given to you. So if you learn to walk by faith, if you learn to live by faith, if you learn to stand on the promises of God in the small things, then one day you may be one of those ones that he activates the gift of faith in for his people and for this church and for this community. So what are you believing for? I had a very good friend of mine who was really a great encouragement. I won't embarrass her, but she was just the best encouragement for me as a new believer. And she said to me, believe for something little. Just believe. Believe. Just trust God that something that you can't do that you just want to see God do and just watch him work and that will build your faith. So I believed God for a haircut. I was a single parent. I had four kids, not a lot of money. Haircuts were a bit of a luxury at that time. I believed God for a haircut and I just probably didn't take it as seriously as maybe I ought to, but I kind of thought, well, God, you can do that, right? You can do a haircut. And that week, TAFE were looking for some models and I got a free haircut. 
I wouldn't say it was the best haircut I ever got, but it was a haircut. And God had come through for me. And it was like a light switch turned on. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> a light switch turned on and all of a sudden, I thought, oh, I could ask God for something else. And it's not Santa. It's not a list of things. Here, God, do my list. I started to believe for people who needed healing. I started to believe for my family for salvation. And some of those things did happen as quickly as that haircut and other things are still happening. And sometimes faith can take a long time to come to pass, but God is faithful. And our role is to simply believe. We had a great speaker come through when we were, I think it was the old Earth Street building, so it'd be a few minutes ago. And his name was Jimmy Matibi. And he came through and he said, cows moo, sheep bar." Cats meow, believers believe. We believe. That's what God's asked us to do, believe. Believe he is who he says he is and that he is able to do what we're asking him to do. That's what we do, we believe. So we can stand on God's promises for daily situations in our families, our marriages, our own walk with God, in our workplace and in our community, and we should be standing on his promises. Our faith is needed. It's what sets us apart as Christians. We are those who follow Christ, and we represent him by our faith to those who are in our sphere of influence. So we've been talking this year about our sphere of influence. What do people know about you? Do they know that you are a person of uncompromising faith? Do they know that? Is that evident to them that you believe God's word and you stand on it no matter what happens, no matter what you see? If we only wait till we receive the gift of faith, then we'll miss the opportunities God wants to use to grow us up in our faith. Jude 1.20 says, But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what I love about today, right now? You can text anyone in this world and it will be there like that, just instant. And you can use that to encourage people, to build up their faith, to remind them that God is faithful. And you can use it to help them when they're starting to feel like maybe it's never going to happen or maybe it's just, maybe God can't or maybe God won't. If you have faith, you can put your faith with theirs and all of a sudden there's an activation of faith and now two people will believe for that thing. And you can get groups going. So you can actually send out encouraging messages to like, I don't know what the limit is, lots of people. Depends how dedicated you are to this system, but I tell you what, it doesn't take much to encourage someone in their faith. But first you must have faith to encourage someone in their faith. So the Holy Spirit is looking for men and women of faith to give the gift of faith to. I know coming up in a couple of weeks, Pastor Brett has said he's going to be praying for people who would like to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit and to activate them in their lives. So the gift of faith will be one that will be prayed for. And I don't know what gift you will receive, but if you receive the gift of faith, understand that God wants you to use it. He intends for you to use that gift. And if you're faithful in the little, more will be given to you. So how is your faith walk? Do you confidently and absolutely know that the God you serve is faithful and that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ask, hope or imagine? Are you leaning on him for those areas in your life where you need a breakthrough or a miracle? Are you praying big prayers, full of faith, full of expectation, full of hope? Faith comes from relationship. It comes from abiding in God, sitting with him, casting your cares upon him because you know that you've learned by experience that he cares for you. It comes from knowing his word and knowing what his word says. It comes from reading the stories of others who have walked by faith and being encouraged. There's so many great testimonies and books and podcasts that you can read about others who stepped out in faith that it actually can spur your faith on to believe for that too. If you're trying to do it all in your own strength, that's not faith. If you think he can't help you or won't help you or you're afraid to ask him, that's not faith. Remember, if it's not faith, it's sin. And that's not meant to be a condemnation. It's a gentle reminder that you may need to come fresh to the Father. There is nothing you can't bring to him. There's nothing you have done that would stop him from hearing your prayer. Has it been a while? When I was preparing this word, I really felt like there were going to be people here who had had prayers in the waiting room for a long time. 
When you first prayed, you prayed with fervency, vigour and passion. But as days turned to weeks and months and even years, you started doubting. Perhaps not that God could, but that God would. Or maybe there was something you needed to do. Today, the Holy Spirit wants you to fan those flames of faith, those smouldering embers back into the roaring flames of confident expectation. God is still on the throne. He is not finished yet. And I believe that we need to come back as individuals and as the body of Christ to the throne room of grace and once more cry out to our Abba Father in faith. We need to call those things that are not as though they are. We need to continue to call the prodigals in. Believe the salvations. You know, we are seeing salvations here weekly, sometimes daily. Geraldton is Salvation City. And it will be known as it once we, the believers, start believing it and declaring it and celebrating it. All of heaven rejoices when one lost one comes home, the Bible says. And last weekend we had 27 come home. Isn't that worth rejoicing over? We should be shouting it in the streets. Let us not take for granted the work that God is doing in the hearts and lives of those that we're praying for. Our church needs rowdy faith, contagious faith, unstoppable faith, unshut upable faith. I'm not sure that's a word. But our city needs churches full of such faith. Our families, our neighborhoods need this. They need the gift of faith and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit activated and actively ministering to those who know God and to those who don't yet know him. We've heard testimonies. People in shopping centres, someone comes up and says, I really just feel I need to tell you this. And a word of knowledge is given. And that activates faith. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are all underpinned by faith. And they activate faith. We need to be sharing the hope the confident expectation that we have in Christ Jesus. This world needs hope more now than ever. Are we sharing it? It's not this little light of mine, as great a song as that was while we were in Sunday school, and I loved it. It's Jesus Christ, the hope of glory living in me. It's the fullness of the deity in Christ Jesus and the fullness of Christ dwelling in me. Do you understand the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, the dynamic, explosive, contagious power of the Holy Spirit that's living in you, that ability to transform people through the power of the gospel, the power to change lives, to set captives free, to heal the brokenhearted, to break chains of addiction. We should be the most optimistic, most faith-filled, most joy-filled people in this community and in the world. We are the church of the book of Acts. Jesus hasn't yet returned to earth. The Holy Spirit still ministers in us and through us to heal, to set free, to deliver, for miracles, for signs and for wonders. The power is in our hands and in our mouths and in our feet. Pastor Brett asked the question, does your faith have feet today? Are you willing to step out of the boat, to speak to the storm, to lay hands on the sick with an absolute expectation that they will recover? Are you willing to pray for your family without ceasing and then pray some more? Are you willing to believe God for the breakthrough, the healing, the provision, the job you need? Are you willing to walk by faith and not by sight? Call those things that are not as though they are. Be the persistent widow and bang on the doors of heaven. Are you willing to ask, seek, knock and pray? Are you willing to believe for revival in our nation? A call to repentance, a turning from our wicked ways. Are you willing to seek God's face until you see with your own eyes the healing of our land? Are you willing to get up a little earlier or take a stand on the watchtower and pray for things bigger than yourself, bigger than your own needs? Faith as small as a mustard seed. That's the smallest seed there is because one small seed of faith in God is all you need to move mountains because it's God's faith. It's given to you by him. It's not determined by your own strength or your own ability or your own power to see that thing happen. It is the faith of God given to you and if it's as small as a mustard seed, it will move mountains. Today is the day of faith. Today is the day of expectation. And if you need to shake yourself today, if you've got a little bit lazy in your faith life, in your prayer life, in your devotion to his word, shake yourself off, get up, get going again in faith. 
My grandmother was a mighty woman of faith. And she left this earth praying for over 50 of our family members for salvation. And when she died, God showed me that that mantle of prayer was now mine to continue. That those prayers were going to be answered. And I believe it's true. And we've got a situation in our family right now, today, that needs miracle working faith. And I know who God is. And I know my grandmother prayed. And I know that my family will be reached for the gospel and I will see them all again in heaven because they will not leave this earth without knowing who my God is. I believe that. I have faith for that, to believe it. And that faith has come through years of standing and believing and trusting God. I stood for 15 years in this church believing for a husband. I think a lot of people probably thought I was a little bit crazy. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> and I believed year in, year out. God sh first showed me in 2008 that I should prepare my heart for marriage. And my kids said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, by faith we call those things that are not as though they are. So on the 8th of the 8th of the 8th, I'm going to get married. Well, that day came and went. <laughs> and they said, well, what are you going to do now? I said, well, we still stand in faith. That's what we do. So on the 9th of the 9th of the 9th, I'm going to believe I'm going to get married. This went on for a little while. Sometime in 2012, my son said to me, what are you going to do next year, Mum? There's no 13th of the 13th of the 13th. I said, I'll still be standing in faith. And on the 5th of the 9th, 2015, seven years after God spoke to me, this amazing man decided that I was worth a risk and he became my husband. We've now been married six years and God is faithful. And I'm not saying that so I can show up except for God's glory. I'm saying that because sometimes we can believe in faith and it might take a while to get there. But God is faithful and he can do what he has promised to do. And all we have to do is stand. There are some things I've been believing for for nearly 17 years that I haven't seen come to pass yet. And I desperately want to see it come to pass. I've been believing for my son since he was 14. And my children, you know, these are heart things. But I still believe our God is faithful. And we need to shake that up in ourselves. We need to remind ourselves just who we serve. We don't serve an impotent God. We don't serve a weak God. We don't serve a God who is not able to do what we're asking him to do. We don't serve a God who is forgetful or lazy or late. We serve a God who is all-powerful and all-knowing and he knows exactly what you need. And he knows exactly the right time that you need it. And your tears and your tantrums and your questions will not shift him. If he does not think it's time for that to come to pass, it will not happen. And if he thinks that it is time to go to pass, you will not stop it. Because he is God. So just remind yourself. Speak to those situations. Dare to believe God can. Dare to believe God will. Dare to believe God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ask, hope or imagine. So what if it has taken too long? Stand in faith anyway. Don't you dare give up now. Don't you dare settle for less than God's best. He is faithful. He is sovereign. He is God Almighty. And the work we need to do is believe and simply believe. It is not too hard. And if you need prayer today for anything, and we have time today, we have time to pray. I wanted there to be time for the Holy Spirit to just come and remind you once again that he is with you and he never leaves you and he never forsakes you. Those things you are believing for are still by faith coming to pass. And so we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask those who are filled with faith and full of the Holy Spirit on our team to come forward and they'll stand with you in faith and they will stand and they will believe for those things you're believing for and they'll encourage you so that you go out of this place with your faith just a little bit firmer you go out of this place believing that your God has said it you believe it it will happen and nobody can shake you when you determine in your heart that God is going to do what you've asked him to do no one can shake you